difference. You'll also see as you look through this document that very rarely do I do the same thing every day. Um, there for a while in the beginning, I was structured passing was something we did a lot um, because I needed us to get on the page and I was changing some technique for some of them. So we did that a lot, like the first thing, warm ups, a warm up game, and then we'd go through that series of passing for a little while. Um, and that would be the only thing that you'll see consistently happening. My opening game is not the same. I don't know about you guys, but I find it boring to know to go to a practice or my kids found it boring to go to a practice where we did, we're gonna do the same thing every day. We could, like you could clock in and go. Because it's really easy then to just show up and dial it in, right? If I don't make it interesting, I don't make it challenging, I don't make it different, then they can just come in and go through the motions of, of practicing versus, you know, dialing in and, and getting, something, getting something done during that time. So I vary a lot of drills. Um, based on what we we're working on at the time. You'll notice there'll be some practices that are very heavy passing specific. Um, or you'll see one where I'm really working on setter hitter con um, connections. Um, so you'll be, you should be able to look at a practice and think, oh, she was feeling like we could go through a lot of different things. Towards the end, there's just a lot of competition, things that are happening towards the end. Um, and there might be some structured passing in the beginning just to remind them to get their feet to the ball, um, but then it would be competition drills and how do you score and how do you uh, put them in out of system situations. So that's sort of a big amount of talking there. Now you guys talk. I'll tell you, I'll give you a topic to talk about, right? Because usually you won't talk because I'm sitting here and you think I should be the only one that talks and none of you are gonna say anything if I don't make you. So. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we'll let the coaches be in their own group. So we'll have, and I'll split this up because I know how this works. Uh, Abby and Judy and, yep, you. Madeline, you're gonna be a group. And then, uh, and Jenna, you can go with that group. And then you and Kira and Annalie. Okay, I did some good names right there. Can we just talk about that? Those of you that have been to center, that's really hard for me. Um, you be a group, right? So right now, you're going to get together in a group and talk about uh, what are three things that you uh, got out of that as a group, so you don't all have to come up with three, but three things that you said, oh, I like that idea, or that sparked some interest in me, three things and one thing that you would like, two things that you would like to know more about. Okay, ready, set, go. Coaches can meet as well. Yes. 
Couple more minutes. <clears throat> Have somebody that's going to speak out for your group too. All right, you guys ready? wants to go first. All right. Get it, girl. Um, do you want to start with, like, let's just, let's go around and talk about the things you got out of it. Okay. Um, well, I thought it was interesting was, like, how you didn't do the same thing every day for practice, because I feel like I've experienced it, like, doing, like, the same thing at practice. Like, it, it just gets, like, kind of, like, boring, and you aren't, like, as interested in, like, don't have as much of a competitive mindset because you aren't being like challenged or anything. So that's what I thought was very interesting. I thought it was interesting about like not trying to change your technique during like gameplay and game setting. I thought that would be a really useful thing to think of. She oh. said mine. Oh, she said mine. No. <laughs> well, well, look at also, me. Also, um, that was interesting was having like the whole like preseason like summer like schedule ahead of time so you could like plan your time around that I think it's like really beneficial to like the team overall you'll get better participation really yeah um you, and like, people will if you plan it ahead of time people can't say I had no idea and I planned everything mm -hmm. yeah. did you have the old memo yeah. well, said it Alan <laughs> said it too yeah. she just forgot <laughs> all right we'll give um, you guys who's we going we liked the um adapting to your team so like when you see your team well, what do they need in a practice plan um collaborating with other coaches making connections all around um drink breaks you saw five minute drink breaks or anything like the four minutes but there's like only four of them um and having different plans daily was a big one and having a detailed specific, 
specific yeah, and I, I toyed, toyed with it last year and I didn't do it. There's no reason why I can't share these with the kids. So I didn't last year, but I'm thinking about the wait, not sharing, sharing the, the document yeah, with them. So if they wanted to see what practice was going to look like today, they could go in and check out the document. I think I may do that next year. Um, I normally have my practice separately, but this year we did it as a running document and, and we, they could go in and check it out. I think that would might be a useful thing to do. We've already listed the practice plan on eBay. Oh, so great. It's at, it's at 150 bucks right now. Right. Perfect. <laughs> All right, coaches. Um, what was reading my notes? Yeah. You won't do it. What our first some... one was competition versus technique. Oh, yeah. Really so, good. yeah, that was our first one. It's focusing on the technique driven, incorporating driven, and competition driven. Because, um, you know, mm -hmm. me, I can do technique. Um, so, I like this. I it's really incorporated hot, yeah. the competition, but now i got to actually go out there and do it. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, and they, it takes the pressure off of them. And it doesn't allow the self-correctors to spend so much time and energy there. That is just, ah. Well, you said it. You're like, thinker, thinker, analyze, overthinker, and mm -hmm. like five of my girls I, ten of them. last practice. They're overthinking everything, and I was like, huh. We've all had the coach or have heard a coach in any sport being the joystick on the sidelines. Sometimes you got to just let them play. Yeah, and if you did, but it, so I would say that, and Alicia was the one that said to me, do they get an opportunity to do that in practice? And I thought, nope. Mm -hmm. And so the minute she said it, I, the light bulb went off, right? So I've been doing this 30 years plus, right? And so I steal from anybody. So if you, if you wanna know where I get my ideas, I steal from anybody who speaks to me. I go to coaches clinic, I go watch people practice. I almost very rarely watch all of the game. When I go watch a game, I oftentimes am watching the coach. I'm watching the coach and what they say and what they do and how they're getting a reaction and, and what they're doing differently. Or I watch teams in camp and what they wanna work on and what they're doing over there. I'm a thief, I'm a thief, thief, thief. And, um, and I will use any resource to my benefit and to my kids' benefit all the time. So I've, and I have no qualms saying that I steal this from, like Alicia said that to me, like she's my kid, right? But she's played at the highest level. So it would be crazy to not pick her brain every once in a while. And so, and Tia calls me from Ferris and runs stuff mm -hmm. off of me when I'm not involved in her program. And then I can give her some insight of what I've, I see. And Jean LeClaire will call or I'll call Jean or like, we'll get on calls and say, oh my God, I'm gonna kill him. I just, uh, somebody, somebody has to say something to them differently to me because I cannot come up with one more way to get this thing across. And then they'll come up with this brilliant thing and I'll be like, uh, and I'll even go so far as to bring another coach in so that they can just hear it from somebody else. Because sometimes you're just tired of hearing it from me. So I have no uh, pride in getting what I need done or asking people for help, so. So she's the one that gave me that. And it, it was perfect for this group of way over thinkers. You know, I had that group before that went to the state finals that got ousted in COVID. Like I had those eight seniors. They were highly competitive, highly competitive. I never had to worry about whether they were gonna be able to compete in the game because they all just were like, I gotta win, I gotta win. And so when they left, I was left with this group that was like, who lived sort of under their shadows who had to find their own way. And so they were super self-critical and they were all these things. And then I thought, I gotta coach you differently. I gotta figure out how to do this differently because you are different than they are. And it doesn't make you bad, it just makes you different. And if I'm the kind of coach that only goes that this is the way it's gonna be and I'm only gonna do it this way and you're gonna fit into my program, we'll never be successful because it doesn't take into consideration who's standing in front of you. So every year I do something different, I say something different, I am different, um, depending on who's sitting in front of me. And so everybody has gotten their own experience. I mean, I had some kids come back and saw me doing something with the kids and they were like, you would never do that with us. And I thought, no, I wouldn't have done this with you because you didn't need this from me, but they need this from me, so that's why they're getting that. So Leland Volleyball, although it has this thing around it, has has been different every year. That's why my theme is different every year. That's why 
it's it, because it's a new team in front of you standing there so mm -hmm. all right let's go did you get all three no that no. was just one why are you putting it all on me no i can do it uh what, we I were see. talking about managing fatigue i think both me mentally and physically uh, throughout the season Big key. Good telltale sign is when Monday's practice is really bad. That's usually a telltale sign yeah. that fatigue's a factor. That's a usually my sign is that we haven't, even our day of rest has not allowed us to come back with renewed energy. Mm -hmm. And that usually signals to me that I gotta give them a day off or I gotta get them out of the gym or I gotta, I gotta do something different, different because they're tired. They can't, they don't have enough in the tank. What was the last thing you were talking about? Not using the same oh, drills over and over. Yeah, practice plan and sharing. Um, I thought it was great being your JV coach in the program and like being able to um, see what the varsity coach has going on and like be able to implement that. And because you never know if the kid needs to be moved up or anything, you just go up front and pull no matter what they're doing. Um, I've always shared my practice plans this last few years, and I found that coach a lot ready and more efficient and maybe do faster uh, than we ever have by sharing yep. um, some of them we've been asked questions before and so that's been fun. That's great. To see some of them lead that way. So. Well on drink breaks, you said something about drink breaks. They're, we're very efficient at drink breaks. They have to break out and then they go and then they're back. Like I, I put in there five minutes um, but they don't take five minutes. Um, so, but my drills oftentimes go over time anyway, so it all works out and then wash. Um, but I usually put uh, my least need to get done drill at the end. So that if everything goes over, I get rid of the one I don't really care about, but I'll throw in a 15, game, 15 pointer at the end that, that if I don't have it, I'm okay with it. So I, I throw that in there so I don't have the most important thing be somewhere back there that I miss because I get caught up working with a hitter or something like that. All right, what are the questions? Two questions. Um, how, do you, how do you like not think, like overanalyze and like critique yourself like in game play? Kids or as a coach? Who are you asking um, me as? <laughs> um, I'll go to the easy one. I don't self-analyze in a game or a match as a coach, but I analyze the heck out of it after it's over. Um, mostly because I feel like if things didn't go the way I wanted them to go, then the easiest thing for me to do is change what I was doing. It, it's more, I am more capable of changing myself than I am changing what everybody else is doing. So if whatever I said or did or we did or didn't know, I put it on myself to make that change um, moving forward. And I'm really quick to recognize when I contributed to the loss by whatever I did or chose to do or didn't do a sub or didn't whatever, I'm very quick to do that. But that doesn't happen until I'm on the drive home, usually. Um, or, or Trav and I'll call if we're in separate cars. My God, did you hear blah, 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 blah? I don't know what I was thinking. That did not work, um, so. But as a player, you have to practice competing. Like it really, that, that idea of turning it off in practice and going, okay, I'm gonna get in this thing and all I'm gonna do is think about winning the point. And if my team wins the point, that's all I care about. How I got the point, whether it was ugly, like it took me a long time to convince my kids that if they whiffed the ball and they scored a point, how disappointed they were. To change that to, uh, no, you whiffed the ball and we still scored. Let's celebrate that because we scored versus judging how well we scored. It, you don't get more of a point if I crush it than if I whiff it and I score. It's still the same point. And so allowing myself to leave that judgment out on the, in practice, I can do all that I wanna do, but there's gotta be a drill in practice where you go, all right, I'm just gonna play to win. I'm playing to win. That's it. 
And then the other thing you can do as a player is limit yourself to only one focus that you're gonna judge yourself on, no matter what the outcome is. So if you say, okay, I'm gonna get my feet to the ball, and you get your feet to ball and you shank the ball straight out of bounds, you are going to reward yourself for getting your feet to the ball. And the shank out of bounds is not your problem, right? And that takes training in practice to get that mindset to happen. But again, if you have somebody that's, you're gonna to have to do it for yourself if you have a coach that is critiquing technique all the time, it's very hard to not think that that's the most important thing to think about. And you cannot focus on more than one thing at a time effectively. So that idea that I'm a multitasker is baloney. You can only keep in your brain one focus and you can only truly affect that thing if you have one thing to think about. So. I will say to kid, you know, I would have my setter or my overthinkers come up to me in front of the game. Fiona is a prime example of, of an overthinker. Um, and she, I would say, I want to know one thing that you're going to do this whole set. And she goes, I'm going to get my elbow high. Okay, so that's the only thing you can talk to me about. It's the only thing you can judge, period. And we, I like, it was all I could do to get that out of her head because she, she wants... Like, I don't know if you've seen her, but she's like, oh, I'm sorry, I was too low. I was so slow. I was like, oh, I will get, I just, uh, yeah, uh. and I would like say, Fiona, just play the game, right? So we like would have this battle and by the end of the season, she wasn't thinking about anything other than destroying somebody on the other side of the net and scoring a point. That's all she cared about. And it took a long time because she wanted to discuss and analyze every little thing she did which then made her really hard to connect with as a setter because then she would change so she she would think she was too early the setter would think i'd set her too low so then she would set her higher and then she would go later and then the, now we're really off and then it was all this stuff and i was like you cannot you just go the same time every time and she'll find you you just you just do your thing and she'll find you that's it right but it's it's hard work and it starts in practice so finding one time in practice where you can go mm, I'm just competing I don't, don't talk to me about technique I'm just competing and then and then you practice it so that when you're in the game you're not doing that then either because the only thing that matters in a game is what scoring more than they'd score so I'm either going to be thinking about how to score or I'm going to thinking about how to stop them from scoring but I'm not gonna think about my feet and my thinking and the thinking and the thinking and the thing. No, I'm gonna play to win. That's what I'm gonna do. So, I'm gonna practice. All right, is that question, both questions, or is that just one? Yeah, we could go into the second. All right. How do you manage your sideline reaction? Our question was about like, do you share your practice plans, but how do you manage your sideline reactions and like competitions and before competitions? What, how, how are you analyzing the other team to help your team get? Okay, how do I manage my own emotions on the sidelines? Yeah. Mm, sometimes I'm really good at it and sometimes I'm not great at it, I would say. I would say now I'm better than I've ever been. Um, and once upon a time, I cost us wins by being so outrageous that my kids would get so tight about and they would get amped and I would literally coach them into a loss. Uh, I was quite aware, I didn't know about it, you know, clearly I thought I was doing the right thing. But one time, for example, uh, we went to a district final and we were the, we were at Glen Lake, we were, at the, we were the better team for sure, like, right? This was way back in the day. And they put posters up on the bus, on their bus and on their side that said Boynton Busters. And our best player was Amy Boynton. And they put her name and they had pictures of her and they had a big thing across them. And I was livid. I was mad and I went in there how dare they and, nah, nah, nah. and I got my girls all worked up and we went out there and we were like we went into warm so we were like crushing balls and we were like wow and we were like so wah, 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 wah. well we went five sets with the team and they were exhausted by the time we got to the fifth set they had zero in the tank because we had spent so much energy in our warm-ups in our anger over what this was that we were like and we lost like we literally lost and we lost because I incited a riot and made them crazy. And then we lost that game. And I look back and then I think, I was so young and dumb. That was just the worst. 
Um, so I manage myself because I learned the hard way. Like if you can learn anything from me, um, I try not to let anybody sort of, I mean, sometimes people think I'm comatose over there because I, I tend not to, to do a lot over there. Um, mostly because my kids are looking for me to do something. Like they're looking to see if I'm gonna be mad or if I'm gonna be disappointed or I'm gonna whatever. And so I try not to let them have anything in that uh, because too many of them are super sensitive to what I think and feel. Um, I've learned uh, that screaming and yelling at officials uh, never works um, and almost always takes you out of, out takes your team out of the mix. Um, I'll tell you a funny time when a coach, this is a funny story. I don't want to time to go. We got plenty. Okay. 35 minutes. If you okay. So I went to watch a game downstate. It was between East Kentwood and Forest Hills Northern. I'm not going to name the coach because he's still coaching somewhere else. So there's a young male coach and then a very seasoned husband and wife team on the other side coaching. And this was a big match. And I mean, the gym was packed. And I don't even remember why I was there, but I was there, I really, the husband and wife coaching team, I knew very well. And I knew of this young up and coming guy a lot. So they're in this match and this team, Forest Hills Northern, had, East Kent was the premier program. And Forest Hills Northern had not ever beaten them. So they're in this match and they're having this thing and they get a server so now the man's, the husband is on the bench. The wife who's the head coach is standing up. So I just want you to get that in your mind. Okay. The male coach on this side is up and standing as well. His server goes on a, is jump serving, ripping jump serves. Like she's ripping balls at them and it's just like flying out of bounds. Like they can't do anything. And they're going on a run. It's like six, seven, eight points. He's losing his mind of excitement about they're gonna beat they're gonna beat this team. These two start talking about a timeout, whether they want to call a timeout or don't call a timeout. He's so busy watching what they're doing that he goes, he thinks they've called a timeout. So he goes, Yeah! Timeout! And his kids go running over to him off the court. The official has blown for the serve. His kids go off the court to timeout. He thinks they blown this. He's so busy watching those coaches and having his big gloaty moment that he, he didn't notice that the whistle was not for a timeout, it was for serve. So off his team goes, she counts five, side out. She doesn't get her serve back. The serve goes to the other side. The place goes berserk. <laughs> he goes berserk. Parents in the stands lost their mind. They came running at the, towards the court. They were red faced. They had to escort parents out of the building. Like it was this crazy moment. But it literally only happened because that coach was so in his moment that he was gonna get oh he was going to get a win over them that he wasn't even paying attention to the game he was just watching the other coaches and I thought serves you right you had just learned a lesson big boy you probably should pay attention to your team and not who's sitting on the other sidelines but he lost in the game they lost they they that run they went on they lost. And I, and I thought there was gonna be a brawl in the stands and it was the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> you just cost them that. But anyway, so that was a, that was a moment where the person didn't clearly have control of themselves. And what was the other question you asked me? Um, how do you like analyze when you're doing warm-ups and stuff the other team to help your team? Like, so I don't have my, I don't get involved. Everybody looks good in warm-ups. I don't know if you notice that, but you know, we've gone to places where we're like, man, this goes are bad balls. We gotta get ready for whatever. And then they can't pass to save their lives. And so they don't look very good anymore, right? So um, I will pay attention to tendencies. Um, so if I'm watching hidden lines on the other thing, I watching that kid who's just drilling the line like I wanna know, is she drilling the line on purpose or is she drilling the line by accident? 
Like, was that a fluke that she just did that? Or does she have that in her repertoire? So I like to know if somebody has the ability to move the ball around a little bit, or if they're pretty limited in, you know, and you can tell if you've been around long enough, you can tell when a kid has that, has the shots when she's warming up because she's warming all that stuff up.